Well, see, the Middle East has been hit by a gigantic political earthquake with the de declaration of the Abraham Accord. It was between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel back in September of this year. Now, following this event, which will completely change the political landscape of the region, an aftershock has also shaken things up and Bahrain has joined in normalizing relations with Israel. The New York Times announced with a headline, a geopolitical earthquake just hit the Middle East. The National Post declared it a historic shift in Middle East politics. The Telegraph asserted that the UAE's Israel olive branch punches a wall through decades of Arab intransigence. The UAE paves the way for Arab Gulf states to normalize their Israeli ties. The Times of Israel reported hailing new era with Arab world. Netanyahu says others will follow UAE's lead. And after the Israel-UAE deal, Kushner indicates more Arab countries will follow. The BBC Kushner Israel UAE Treaty, a massive change for the region. We are witnessing peace and prosperity coming to the nation of Israel, which has not been seen since its modern rebirth. Now, the scenes we've seen only a couple of months ago are a far cry from when the Arab League, Arab, Arab League declare, declared after the Six Day War in 1967, which as many of you will know, and some may even remember, the three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. An insistence on the rights of the Palestinian people in their own country. As a side point, the UAE and Bahrain were not part of the Arab League in 1967, but they did join it in 1971. Well, it was only in September that we've watched in amazement as an Israeli LL plane decorated with the word peace in English, Hebrew and Arabic. It's named Kiryat Gat after an early community in the state of Israel founded in 1955 by Jewish refugee families from Morocco. And it's, it was this plane from Israel was greeted by UAE delegates at the Abu Dhabi airport. This is quite a phenomenal sight. The LL flight path taking the delegation to Abu Dhabi was also highly significant. Being the first publicly acknowledged entry of an Israeli plane into Saudi Arabia airspace and the first direct flight operated by a commercial airline between Israel and the UAE. The flight even took a little detour, a little flyover, directly over Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. The delegation on board included Israel National Security Advisor, his American counterpart, and US Presidential Advisor. And he proclaimed, this is a very hopeful time, and I believe that so much peace and prosperity are possible in this region and around the world. Ben Shabbat, who was on the plane, said, our goal is to formulate a joint plan to promote relations in the fields of health, aviation, innovation, science, tourism, and technology. Now, let's put this in context. In 1979, Egypt had its membership in the Arab League suspended and they were actually economically and diplomatically punished for signing the peace treaty with Israel. Bahrain and the UAE even withdrew their ambassadors. So who would have expected that in 2020, we have an LL plane carrying an Israeli delegation arriving at Abu Dhabi airport to finalize a peace agreement? Now, according to USA Today in 2019, United Arab Emirates was the seventh richest country in the world. 
and Bahrain was the 23rd richest. So they're not short of a penny, these Arabs. Both nations rely heavily on petroleum exports to finance their economics, e economies, and they're looking to diversify. The, the oil is running out. Israel's innovative economy, leading in tech, and we do know that Israel is a technology leader in the world. It's a perfect match for these nations looking for opportunities to invest and partner in technology. An article on the website Israel 21C presented six unexpected ways that Israel and the UAE are celebrating their new ties. The first of these was coding across borders. It's an education company with over a million students in 20 plus countries, and they opened an office in Dubai, and they're bringing to get together 200,000 Emirati and Israeli students to collaborate on developing apps. On the Times of Israel news website, an article spoke of, it's on the right hand side there, medical tourism from the UAE reported that the Sheba Medical Center says Israel will become popular destination for treatment due to geographical proximity to the Gulf state and the convenience of having many Arabic speakers on staff. Israel predicts trade with the UAE at four billion a year within three to five years. A former, uh, former uh, is a member of the Israeli Knesset said this, this may not be the first peace deal between Israel and an Arab country, but it is one of the first to feel like true peace. The article goes on to comment, Israelis had resigned themselves to the fact that their accords with Egypt and Jordan were the best that could be hoped to form from an Arab country. Then along comes the UAE, proposing a relationship with an Arab country resembling what we have always imagined peace should be. Not only does it speak of two-way two -way tourism, direct flights and broad-based open economic and scientific cooperation, the entire tone is one of warmth and appreciation. And from a tourism perspective, I'm just amazed. Look at that middle one. It's a, it's a, it's from Tel Aviv uh, Tourism, and it says, "Dear friends in the United Arab Emirates, from our sandy beach to yours, we can't wait to welcome you here to Tel Aviv." Just amazing that these things are happening in front of our eyes. Yes, yeah, sure, though, he says, there will be bumps along the way and there will be problems, but the direction is towards peace and prosperity. Well, the following are three areas where the Abraham Accord could be even more momentous than the peace treaty with Egypt back in 1979. The first, well, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain are wealthy, prosperous countries looking to invest. In contrast to the peace agreement with Egypt, this agreement will have a massive influence on not only Israel's economy, but the region's economy. The second point is that other Arab countries did not follow in Egypt's footsteps making peace with Israel. And the peace agreement has always been even what the diplomats call a cold peace. The next peace treaty Israel signed were the Oslo Accords in 1993. And it was a peace treaty with Jordan, but this also, you could say, has been a cold peace. However, in this case, a number of other Gulf states are expected to follow the Emirates' example. Bahrain's already been there. Oman has also welcomed the normalization of ties between Israel and Bahrain. And the commentators are saying there will be more. And thirdly, in the peace agreement with Egypt, Israel had to give up the Sinai. In this agreement, Israel has postponed annexing some of the West Bank, but in actuality hasn't given anything up. It seemed unlikely that Israel's current unity government would have moved ahead with annexation anyway. Instead of giving land for peace, which is what previous deals have been based on, this agreement is a first of giving peace for peace. So let's turn to Bible prophecy in Ezekiel 38. Well, from a Bible prophecy viewpoint, there are two major points to take note of. First is if 
if the UAE and Bahrain use their financial capital in Israel's innovative technology sector, an already prosperous Israel will move ahead in leaps and bounds, even more so if still more of the other Gulf states join in. And secondly, and more important for us Bible students, this cements and clearly defines two forming coalitions in the Middle East, Iran and its allies to the north, supported by Russia, and the Gulf states and their allies to the south, partnering with Britain and America. Britain has had close ties with the Gulf states for many years. A peace between Israel and the Gulf states has the potential for a stronger boost to Israel-UK ties. Three prophecies present a clear picture of a coalition to Israel's north and one to their south in the latter days. These are Ezekiel 38, Daniel and Zechariah. It's going to turn on a little bit of light. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 describes a time of peace and prosperity that will be found in the land of Israel in the latter years, when the Jewish people have returned to the mountains of Israel, which have lain waste for many years. Israel is described as prosperous, dwelling confidently in peace in their land without walls, bars and gates. It is at this moment when Israel is recognized as dwelling in peace that the Northern Alliance, led by Gog, thinks an evil thought. Ezekiel 38, verse 14 and 15 says this, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. With thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. The reason for the inv invasion are stated in verse 12. First, to take a spoil, and secondly, to lay their hands upon the desolate places in the mountains of Israel that are now inhabited. As this hostile host of nations from the north moves upon the mountains of Israel, Ezekiel 38 also predicts an alliance to Israel's south. Sym sympathetic in questioning the invasion. Ezekiel 38, 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy, com thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Well, Daniel 11, just taking a, a small diversion to Daniel and Zechariah, Daniel 11 focuses on the two warring pieces of the Greek Empire, which are depicted in Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 2 as cast in brass, one brazen empire to the north of Israel and one brazen empire to the south, the king of the north and the king of the south. And Zechariah, in Zechariah 6, it describes two brazen mountains, suddenly cutting between them and thundering out into the earth are four chariots of the cherubim, which accomplish the work of the spirit in the earth. It must be remembered that Zechariah prophesied after the exile, and therefore his readers had in their hands both Ezekiel and Daniel, and would have been able to identify the two brazen mountains. A mountain symbolizing an empire is the king of the north and the king of the south. So at the time of the end, there will be a king of the north and a king of the south with Israel between them. To the north will be a coalition dominated by Russia, allied with Europe, and having with them Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. To the south will be a bloc consisting of the merchant powers of Tarshish, allied with Sheba and Dedan. Sandwiched in the middle, a restored nation of Israel, and we find them dwelling peacefully, securely, and prosperously. Let's take a moment to ask who was Sheba and Dedan? 
Well, there are many clues to the identification of Sheba today. It has been historically and archaeologically seen, but to be the ancient Arabian kingdom based in what today is Yemen. Jacinius identifies Sheba with the Sabaeans, a nation and region of Arabia. He supposes there were two Arabian tribes, Sheba and Dedan, one in southern Arabia and one based in northern Arabia. Smith's Bible Dictionary identifies Sheba with the great South Arabian kingdom and the people which composed it. In the Bible as history, it's a book by Werner Keller. It identifies Sheba with the ancient kingdom of Sheba based in southern Arabia, which was a merchant power who did business with the kingdom of Israel under Solomon. And even though the Biblical Archaeology Review publication usually takes a critical approach against the Bible, it's worth noting in this case, the 2016 issue asked the question, Arabia or Africa, where is the land of Sheba? And the article concluded, there is a well-documented kingdom of Sheba that existed in biblical times. It is documented both historically and archaeologically, and it is not in Ethiopia, but rather in southern Arabia, which is modern day Yemen. Yemen can rightfully claim to be the place of the historical kingdom of Sheba. And in the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem, you can, uh, it's, it's a little bit grainy on the text, but there's a photo there on the left. It's the, it's the, it's an exhibition at the moment uh, on display at the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem. It's called From Sheba to Jerusalem. And it confirms this once again. The exhibit clearly confirms the location of Sheba as being in southwest Arabia. And you'll see the title there, Yemen. Dedan. Spoken of in conjunction with Sheba as mentioned in Isaiah 21, where the prophet says, The burden upon Arabia, in the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye travelling companies of Dedanim. Dedanim is the plural of Dedan. These companies traveled through Arabia along the spice route and down to Sheba, trading in the region, quite likely bringing goods from India across Arabia to the ancient Middle East. Some of the goods brought by the Navy that Solomon commissioned of Hiram in 1 Kings 10 are identified as being from India. Dedan operated on the east coast of Arabia, their companies traveling throughout the region trading precious goods from the east. This is the region of modern day UAE and Bahrain. So we can see that Sheba and Dedan refer to the peoples of Arabia. Uh, there's a page there from the Saudi Arabia Tourism Guide, and it's got one of the uh, one of the regions is Dedan. While the kingdom of Sheba was based in Yemen. The area referred to as Sheba and Dedan refers to much of the area of Arabia, not just a small part of it. We expect that much of the Arabian Peninsula will be allied with the Tarshish powers and Israel at the time of Ezekiel 38. A New York Times piece by a man called Thomas Friedman summed up the Abraham Accord that was just signed this way. This deal will certainly encourage the other Gulf sheikdoms, which are Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, all of which have had covert and overt business and intelligence dealings with Israel, to follow the Emirates' lead. They will not want to let the UAE have a leg up in being able to marry its financial capital with Israel's cyber technology nor their agriculture technology and healthcare technology, with the, with the potential to make both countries stronger and more prosperous. These Emirati and Arab countries are competitive with each other and they can't afford uh, one to get too far out in front. But there's another message, a deeper and potentially more psychological. This agreement was the UAE telling the Iranians and all their proxies, there are really two coalitions in the region today. Those who want to let the future bury the past, 
and those who want to let the past keep burying the future. The UAE is taking the helm of the first, and it's leaving Iran to be the leader of the second. And this article talks about how Iran and the Palestinians lose out in the Abraham Accords. The Sunday Telegraph says a NATO-like alliance against Iran could be created after Israel peace deal with the UAE. The article continues and says Israel's historic peace deal with the Arab United Arab Emirates could be the first step in forging a bold NATO-like alliance against the Iranian regime, according to the Jewish state's former foreign affairs chief. And a map accompanying the article showed how the Middle East was divided over the deal. Green countries are those who support the deal, the red are those who condemn the deal or have condemned the deal, and the yellow are currently the countries that are sitting on the fence. And already we see king of the north or an area of the north and an area of the south. If you like planes, You've probably heard of the F-35. It is one of the most amazing military aircraft uh, and, and certainly um, that, that exists uh, in the, on the planet today. And, I, and this is a really interesting quote from one of the articles. It says, in many ways, the Abraham Accords amount to an arms deal. The UAE and other states that now engage with Israel will find themselves armed with a better class of American weaponry. Obviously, the uh, Israel's already dealing with uh, and, and, and pals with the, uh, with the US. The US has pledged for a very long time to maintain Israel's qualitative military edge. But the UAE in particular might have just arranged for itself a similar promise. Well, when we let's turn back to Ezekiel, and when we examine Ezekiel 38 a little further, we discover that there is a key element required before the king of the north drops into the land. That element is a form of peace. The land that the king of the north and her confederates will sweep through is a land of unwalled villages. Ezekiel 38:11 prophesies of the thoughts of the northern invader. I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. The picture painted is one of a land believing that they are safe. A land and belief that they're secure and without threat, without walls. This prophecy can only take place when Israel is at peace with their neighbours. This underlines the significance of what we've witnessed this year. This is a quote from, it's a tweet from the Department of State. President real Donald Trump on the Abraham Accords. The world sees that they're choosing cooperation over conflict, friendship over enmity, prosperity over poverty, and hope over despair. There's a quote there, Arabs and Israelis, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together, pray together, and dream together. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the ecclesia in Thessalonica in the first century, he was inspired to prophesy of the time when Jesus would come back. And he wrote this. I'm going to read from the ESV, even though the quote there is from the King James. He wrote, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The Accords, the Abraham Accords that have just been signed by the leaders of the respective nations state clearly 
we pursue a vision of peace, security, and prosperity in the Middle East and around the world. Another quote from the real Donald Trump. Thanks to the great courage of the leaders of these three countries, we take a major stride towards a future in which people of all faiths and backgrounds live together in peace and prosperity. I don't know if you can see on the on the screen, but check out the grin on the guy on the right. He is just as happy as Larry, where he is, what he's doing, and what he's signing. This is the picture of the Middle East that is now beginning to emerge. And it's happened this year while we've been distracted with everything else that's going on. The very picture we expected before the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and before we read in Ezekiel 38, the king of the north will drop down into Israel. Some of the final pieces of the jigsaw are being put into place. <laughs> 